And thus to explain our signs and evidences for those who reflect. And this shows that science uses many researchers in many countries around the world. Over أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. I'll start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious and the most merciful. And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start today's proceedings by welcoming you all on behalf of the Sydney University Muslim Students Association. I'd like to commence by giving you a brief introduction to the role that the Muslim society plays here at Sydney Uni. The Muslim Society is present on campus to help facilitate and cater for the needs of the Muslim students. SUMSA strives to create an environment that caters for the academic, social and spiritual needs of all Muslim students on campus as well as establishing dialogue and interfaith relations with the wider student community. SUMSA has a weekly Islamic lecture program and, regular, and regularly organises barbecues, charity fundraisers, interfaith debates, sports events and the famous Islamic Awareness Week which, was, which is currently being held. Based out of the prayer room in the Old Teachers College, a religious and social hub open to all, SUMSA hopes to reach any curious student on campus. So if you're a practicing curious, so if you're a practicing Muslim or just curious about Islam or just open to a different experience, SUMSA has got something for you. During Islamic Awareness Week, we aim to host a variety of Islamic lectures and activities, and activities aimed at promoting dialogue amongst Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Please be sure to attend our remaining lectures throughout the week. I'd like to, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed speakers today, Hamza Zodzis and Ian Bryce. I would like to pass you on to today's Master of Ceremonies, Hisham Krayam. In the name of God, the most gracious and most merciful, all praise and thanks belong to Him, the Creator of the universe and all that exists. May His peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon Him. Today, we ask a question and we discuss a topic that is very important, has been important since the beginning of humanity. The question or the topic, the proposition being put forth is that the godless are deluded. As you'll be able to extract from that, the focus of the topic today will be around the existence of God. And perhaps by extension, other things which our speakers will address. Since the beginning of time, man has talked about God, man has worshipped God or gods. Man has came up with arguments for or against a God. And these debates have been going on for centuries, over centuries, over centuries and they continue, continue until the modern day. The tools we have used to conclude whether God exists or does not exist has differed over time. More recently, the use of science has been a common tool for certain people. And it is here today where we'll probably find a lot of the argument against this proposition and also the abundance of skepticism which has crept into human thought is also a big part of whether God exists or not. And so the proposition again being put forth today is that the godless are deluded. The affirmative will be our friend and colleague and our brother from the UK. And just a brief background about Hamza. Hamza is an international public speaker on Islam. He's a regular speaker at universities across the UK and he's one of the main initiators of the contemporary emergence of Muslim public speakers using Islamic and Western philosophy to shed light on Islam and demystify the Islamic way of life. He's a writer having authored articles, essays and commentaries on political philosophy, the philosophy of religion and society. Hamza is an intellectual activist actively engaging 
on issues pertaining to religion, social cohesion, and politics. He's also a researcher with a recent publication on non-Muslim perceptions on Islam and Muslims. Hamza regularly appears in the media explaining and demystifying Islam and providing unique perspectives on current affairs. Hamza lectures all around the world on topics related to Islam, philosophy, and politics. And so the one closest to my right, as I'm sure most of you have already concluded, is Hamza. So uh, we'll be hearing from Hamza very shortly. Our second speaker, our guest today is Ian Bryce. Ian Bryce is a quali qualified in physics and engineering and has worked in industry as an aerospace engineer. He has lectured at four universities creating his own courses. Ian likes teaching young people about space, science and engineering and more recently morality. He also uses poetry to communicate science. He is chief investigator for the Australian Skeptics where he evaluates doubtful claims using the tools of science. Ian has vigorously debated on God and religion on many forums for 30 years and was branded the ARC Secularist by the ABC. He is the Vice President of the Secular Party of Australia and has stood in three elections. And by default, Ian is obviously the one furthest away from me, sitting at the front there on, the, on my right. Well, before we get into the structure of today's program, we'll br briefly go over a few of the rules and etiquettes for today. Please, general etiquettes whenever you're in a lecture hall, whether it be about religion or about God or about anything else, phones off, pay attention to the speakers, do not chat to the person next to you. If you need to leave, please leave quietly, use one of the exits. The bathrooms are outside, so please use the bathrooms if you must. We also ask that no one call out during while each of our speakers is speaking, no one make any rude comments or any, anything disrespectful. There will be no warnings, rude comments, anything disrespectful, called out, will be, the person will automatically be asked to leave. Um, and that's to ensure that we have a healthy discussion and also one that's constructive. If we're bogged down by every person or every second person wanting to put in their two cents, well then, uh, really we're not going to have achieved much of a debate today. So in the spirit of the debate, let, let us uh, follow those rules. There will be time for question and answers at the end, so don't worry if you want to ask a question, if you feel he said something wrong or no one pulled him up on that point, then you, you'll have the chance to score um, in that regard. Just to go through the, sketch, the, the structure of today's program, the main presentations will begin uh, straight after this with Hamza going first. He'll be going, he, he obviously represents the affirmative and that will proceed for 20 minutes and then the negative team will go and that will continue for 20 minutes. Again, the affirmative will go for 10 minutes and then uh, the negative will go for 10 minutes. We'll then have a break for 15 minutes, oh sorry, 10 minute break, and then we'll continue again with our cross-examinations. Uh, Hamza will go first with his cross-examinations and then Ian will go second. And then we'll have the conclusion, five minute conclusions each. Again, Hamza concluding first and Ian concluding second. Um, and then we'll have a 30 minute Q&A session. So this is where you get to ask questions. In the meantime, if you feel a real urge, you get an emotional sprout that you need to just shoot up and ask something, uh, please contain yourself. Uh, I'm sure we're all able to do that. Write it down on a piece of paper, write it on your phone. There'll be a number you can SMS uh, your questions to. Uh, if you don't want to stand up and ask those questions. So there will be 30 minutes at the end for that. Again, this is to have a constructive discussion, constructive debate, and that's what we're here for today. So I ask everyone to open their hearts and their minds to what's about to be heard, and I'd like to call up our first speaker, uh, Brother Hamza Tzoros.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله to proceed brothers and sisters in Islam and brothers and sisters in humanity I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu The godless delusion I will argue today that if we use our reason, if we use our rational faculties, logic, our minds, our brains, and even our hearts, we will come to the conclusion that God is not a delusion, but rather atheism is a delusion. To argue that God is not a delusion, I will use the following arguments. Only two very simple arguments. Number one, God makes sense of the origins of the universe and number two, God makes sense of the nature of a book called the Quran. Let's go straight to the first argument. God makes sense of the origins of the universe. Now, we obviously have asked the question, why does the universe exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? Now, the grandfather for neo-atheism, Bertrand Russell, he said on a radio program, I believe in the 1960s, that the universe is a brute fact, it's just there. Didn't begin, it won't end. But the implication of this is that the universe is eternal. And if the universe is eternal, it implies it is in a actual state of physical infinity. But the question is, can we have an actual state of physical infinity. Of course we can't. And to highlight why this is the case, take the following example into consideration. Say for instance we have an infinite number of balls in this room. And I physically take five balls away. How many balls do we have left? Mathematicians will say infinity. Logicians may say infinity minus five. But the problem is, from a practical level, taking it away from the abstract notion of mathematics and applying it to the real world, it leads to problems and contradictions. This is why mathematicians Kasman and Newman, they said, the infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense that there are fish in the sea. Now there's an important note here because there is a difference between a mathematical infinity and God's infinity with the physical infinity. Take for instance, God's infinity is not referring to a collection of items of an infinite number of elements. So God's infinity can be described as qualitative. We are talking about the quantitative infinity, which is a collection of physical items to form a totality. So this leads to our deductive argument. Number one, an actual infinite in the physical world cannot exist. Number two, an eternal universe is an actual physical infinite. Number three, an eternal universe cannot exist. Number four, therefore the universe is finite. Number five, therefore it had a beginning. This is why the likes of Ali Ghazali, the 11th century theologian, Ibn Taymiyyah, the 14th century theologian, they said that the universe had a beginning. Now since we know the universe began with using deduction, which means the conclusion necessarily follows, then we could explain the beginning of the universe in the following way. Number one, it came into being or it was created from or by nothing. Number two, it was created by itself. Number three, it was created by something else that was created. Or number four, it was created by something uncreated. Let's go to the first option. Could the universe come from or via nothing? Well, what do we mean by nothing? We don't mean the Professor Krauss nothing, which is something, by the way. If you read his book, he says, universe is something physical, okay? Which is a bit crazy. We have to call the police because I think he's murdered the English language. Because it's like me saying, for example, yesterday I had a great dinner and it was uh, nothing. <laughs> so what we mean by nothing is basically non-being or the absence of something, in this case, the universe itself. So based on our, on our own definition, the universe couldn't come from nothing because being can't come from non-being. This is why P.J. Zwart in his publication About Time says, if there is anything we can find inconceivable is that something could arise from nothing. 
Well, could the universe create itself? Well, simply put, this is impossible because it implies a contradiction that something exists and doesn't exist at the same time. If you don't understand this notion, think about your mother. Could she give birth to herself? Messy thought, don't think too much. <laughs> Let's go to the next option. Well, could the universe be created by something else that was created? Or if you want more abstract philosophical language, could the universe come into being by something that came into being? Well, this is, a, this is irrational because that would imply an infinite, infinite regress of causes. Now take the following example into consideration. If Universe 1 got its causal power from Universe 2, and Universe 2 got its causal power from Universe 3, and Universe 3 got its causal power from Universe 4, and that went on forever, would we ever have Universe 1? Of course we wouldn't. It would be an absurdity. That's why the Islamic philosopher and thinker Dr. Jafar Idris, he summarizes this point and he says there will be no series of actual causes. So the best explanation, brothers and sisters and friends, is that the universe was created by something uncreated. It's the most rational explanation using empiricism, using logic, using all types of knowledge. And this is why the philosopher Abraham Varghese, he explains this quite well. And it shows the connection between the Muslim and the atheist Believe it or not. He says, now, clearly theists and atheists can agree on one thing. If anything at all exists, there must be something preceding it that always existed. How did this eternally existing reality come to be? The answer is it never came to be. It always existed. Take your pick. God or the universe. Something always existed. And since the universe began, therefore, this uncreated reality is the divine reality. Let's keep on thinking about this, because when we use conceptual analysis, which means use your brain, we can conclude that this uncreated creator is, number one, eternal, because he's uncreated. Number two, he's transcendent, because he created the universe. For instance, if I were to create this table, I don't become the table. I am distinct and disjoined from the table. Number three, it must have a will, because if it's eternal, and it brought into existence the universe that began, it must have chose the universe to come into existence. And choice indicates a will. It must be powerful. Split one atom and you have a lot of energy. So the one that created this reality with all these atoms must be powerful. It must be knowing. It must have knowledge because it created laws in the universe like the law of gravity and a law giver implies knowledge. It also must be one, because if it has a will, then if we use the argument of exclusion, then we can say it must be one will, therefore one God. And this is summarized by the late scholar Ibn al-Iz al-Hanafi. He says, if there were two creators and they disagreed about something, such as one wanted or willed to move X, whereas the other did not want it moved, then logically speaking, there are only three possibilities. First, the wills of two of them are both carried out. Second, only the will of one of them is carried out. And third, the will of neither of them is carried out. And we know that the first is impossible, the third is impossible, therefore there must be only one will. And we could discuss this later. So what we've concluded is what Islam concluded 1400 years ago, people, in a very profound way in the 112th chapter in the Quran, the book that Muslims believe came down for humanity. In the 112th chapter it says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ السَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِيدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ Say, He is God, the unique, the uniquely one. God the eternal, the absolute, He begets not, nor is He begotten, there is nothing like unto Him. And we could address contentions to this argument later. So let's go to the second argument today, which is, God makes sense of the nature of the Qur'an. Now the Qur'an has been described by Eastern and Western academics as a very intrusive text. It wants to impose itself on everyone. Don't worry my secular friends, this imposition is very positive because it wants to positively and warmly intrude and impose in a compassionate way with your heart and your mind. And the way it does this is by asking profound questions. And in themselves, do they not see? And thus to explain our signs and evidences for those who reflect. 
يَتَفَكَّرُونَ coming from the triliteral stem فَكَرَى which means in the Arabic tradition that the thing that you're reflecting upon think deeply, look beyond, scratch the surface don't be a secularist, an atheist or a humanist don't be blinded by the shallowness of the kind of direct empirical reality go beyond, think that step further Interestingly, it also addresses all types of knowledge. Not only religious knowledge, not only logical truths and innate truths, but also empirical realities. The Quran, read the Quran, it mentions knowledge over a hundred times, and in the context of the Quran, it refers to empirical realities. For instance, it says, have you not seen the created thing like the camel and how we created it? It talks about, go to the horizons, look into the horizons and in yourselves, and you will know that this is the truth. It also says, look how the universe was created and established. There are so many empirical realities. So if someone says to you today, or tomorrow, or the next day, that Quranic knowledge is only limited, that's wrong. It's a shallow reading of the Quranic discourse. However, the Quran goes further than this. The Quran actually challenges mankind concerning its authorship. The Quran in the second chapter, verse 23 says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَتُّ بِسُورَةِ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدُعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you are in doubt, oh my fellow secularist, humanist, skeptic, so-called thinker, if you are in doubt, then bring one chapter like it concerning this book we have revealed to Muhammad upon him be peace. And challenge it. And bring your philosophers, your thinkers, your Dawkins, your Hitchens, your Harrises, your Dennets, your Krauses, and any other pseudo-intellectual. Bring them, as the Arabs say, Hadayallah. <laughs> Bring them and try and challenge the Quranic discourse. And we know the Quranic discourse here is referring to an array of miracles in the Quran. One of these include the linguistic inimitability, the linguistic miracle of the Quranic discourse. And what we mean by miracle is not the David Hume miracle, it's just a violation of natural law. That's very incoherent. What we mean by miracle is the inability to establish a natural causal link between the event and the nature of the event. So how is the Quran a linguistic miracle? Well, the Quran descopes the Arabic language concerning its structural features. It's not what you would call saja'ah, rhyme prose. Mursal, straightforward speech, maqama, a combination of prose and poetry. It doesn't adhere to any of the rhythmical patterns of classical poetry. It descopes the Arabic language from a structural perspective. It's not based on an aesthetic reception like Shakespeare. It's based on the structural features. And interestingly, when we exhaust the 20 letters of the Arabic language and the finite grammatical rules, we exhaust them. We go to the nature of the event. We can't produce the Quranic discourse. But it's supposed to come from Arabic. So we go back to Arabic and we exhaust all the finite combinations. And yet, we are dumbfounded. We can't produce the Quranic discourse. It is no wonder the famous Arabist from the University of Oxford, Oxford, Hamilton Gibb, he was open about this and very frank. He says, the Meccans, the people at the time of Revelation, still demanded of him a miracle and with remarkable boldness and self-confidence Muhammad as a supreme confirmation of his mission to the Quran itself like all Arabs the connoisseurs of language and rhetoric well then if the Quran were his own composition other men couldn't rival it let them produce ten, verse, ten verses like it if they could not and it is obvious that they could not let them accept the Quran as an outstanding evidential miracle so we have another deductive argument concerning the Quranic discourse. Number one, a miracle is an event that has no natural causal link with the nature of the event. Number two, the Quran's literary form has no natural causal link with the Arabic language. Number three, therefore the Quran is a miracle. Number four, since the Quran is a miracle, it makes sense of God's existence. As Professor Bruce Lawrence said from Duke University in his book, The Quran, a biography on page number eight, he says, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, layered within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. Now let's address some contentions here. Someone may say, hey, Shakespeare is unique. Well, according to some Muslims, it will be Sheikh Zabur. 
But Shakespeare's not unique. If you study Shakespeare and we actually go beyond the Googleisms, we'll be able to understand that Shakespeare had something called the iambic pentameter, the blank verse, the trochaic verse, that was used by Christopher Marlowe and John Fletcher and many others. You may think, well, I'm not an Arab. How can I know this? You don't have to be an Arab. You can use rational deduction. Accept a universally accepted statement, which, no, which is, no one has been able to produce or imitate the Quranic form. Well, therefore, we have some possibilities. It could have come from an Arab. But we know it couldn't have come from an Arab because the Arabs tried and failed and they exhausted all possibilities. Could it come from a non-Arab? Well, that's impossible because you need to know Arabic. Well, maybe it came from Muhammad upon whom, be, upon whom be peace. He was a genius par excellence. Well, I think we have an undercutting defeater for that contention. Because any human expression, if we have the blueprint today, we can emulate it. Take post-impressionism in art, Monet, Picasso and others. If you have the canvas, the texture, the brush strokes, the style, the colors, you can emulate it. So we have very expensive imitations. So therefore, we can conclude it is from the divine reality. Other people may claim, well, this argument is very subjective, it's based on language, it's, it's subjective, it's based on how you feel, you know, just like Shakespeare, oh, Romeo, Romeo, where art, where art thou, Romeo, an Islamic version would be, oh, Abdullah, oh, Abdullah, where art thou, Abdullah, <laughs> deny thy tribe, <laughs> deny thy culture, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, the sisters would laugh the most at that one, so the point is, it's not about aesthetic reception, if you were attentive, it's about a direct observable feature called the literary form. Does it have a syllabic rhythmical pattern, an accent-based rhythmical pattern? Does it end with a rhyme? Does it have an, an amount of rhetorical devices that we can count? It's observable. So from this perspective, we have two good arguments that God is not a delusion. The miraculous nature of the Quranic discourse and the origins of the universe. Now, there's other aspects to the Quranic discourse that make it miraculous too. For example, we have something called numerical consonants, numerical coherence. The Quranic discourse was revealed over a 23 year period, brothers and sisters and friends, for specific times and places. Yet it has this amazing kind of mathematical and literary structure. Let me give you some examples. In the third chapter, God says, the likeness of Jesus is the likeness of Adam. They both didn't have a father. And funny enough, or interestingly enough, they're both mentioned 25 times each. And up to this verse, they're mentioned 7 times each. Interestingly, you have the largest chapter in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, second chapter, revealed over a nine year period for specific times and places. 286 verse. Let's do a karate chop in the middle. Haya! And you have the 143rd verse, and you find the word middle. Interestingly, from a structural perspective, from a structural perspective, the shortest chapter in the Quran, Surah al kawthar has 10 words, has the use of 10 letters in each verse, and uses 10 letters only once throughout the whole chapter. And this was a road of a 23 year period for specific times and places, people. It could only mean that the author knew the future. Finally, in my one and a half minutes, I'd like to add, atheism is not an intellectual exercise by Allah, by God, I really believe it's a psychological disposition. I do believe that. I don't mean that in an offensive way. I mean that in a psychodynamic way. So, I would think that in order for us to engage with this topic properly, intellectualism won't work. I think atheists just need a little bit of Muslim love. <laughs> Asalaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah. Oh, sorry, sir. And uh, we won't waste any time. We'll go straight to Ian. So uh, Ian will be up next for the negative. systems have we? Yes, we do one for the camera. Great. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you. So, um, my case on the, on the topic of the godless are deluded is, of course, the negative. And as you can see there, can you hear me all right? Test, sp speak up. Okay, I can't speak much louder than that. I can reposition the microphone a bit. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay. Now, if any of you would like to make further contact after the event, perhaps to discuss the views in a bit more detail, you're welcome to approach either the Secular Party or Sydney Atheists. Uh, the websites are given there. Or alternatively, you can approach the Humanist Society, which there are quite a few members here. And uh, there's quite a few free thought organisations in Sydney that would ha be happy to discuss it. Now, I will show that the delusion lies with religion and Islam in particular. There's two parts. I'm going to talk firstly about what science tells us about Islam, and that's going to show us that Islam and all religions are false. And the second part will be what morality tells us, and that'll be that Islam leads to the worst violations of human rights. Firstly, what science tells us. Hamza has already given us a bit of an indication on his version of science and what he thinks that tells us about the Koran. But instead, I'm going to lead you through a little story about science. And you can see here, th this is a little diagram about perhaps where science comes from. Firstly, we have an early scientist called Aristarchus who came up with the idea that the Earth goes around the Sun and the Moon goes around the Earth. Then this one's Galileo, who was the first to use a telescope to look at the stars followed by Kepler, who was the first to describe the planetary motions. Does any of you know who, the, who this one might be in this diagram? Anyone like to hazard a guess? Yes. Isaac Newton. He's observing an apple fall, and that's reminding him that gravity pulls apples towards the Earth and it also pulls planets towards suns. And this one, of course, is Albert Einstein, the founder of relativity and that famous equation and I think most of you would know of Stephen Hawking. So there's a string of scientists spanning more than 2,000 years, each building on the ideas of the previous one. And this shows that science uses many researchers in many countries around the world over hundreds or thousands of years and with constant checks and balances. Let's look at religion instead. Here's a picture of how Islam originated. And you can see that there's... Excuse me. In the middle we have the Prophet Muhammad. I dare not even show his image because people have been murdered for doing that. And he claims that God came to him via the Archangel Gabriel in a cave one night and revealed everything to him. As a result of that, he dictated to other people the details, the, the surahs of the Quran, and later on uh, his other writings were put into other reports called hadiths and hence rose the um, origin of Islam. Now can you spot the weak point compared to science? It all hinges on one person. Not a hundred scientists over a thousand years but one person's experiences in one night. And frankly that doesn't stack up in the slightest. Now, Hamza has justified Islam in the following terms, roughly, that it's a literacy and linguistic miracle, the Quran, and therefore it must be divinely made. Well, that doesn't follow at all. Let's look at some particular examples, some quotes from the Quran. Allah will burn you forever in fire. Unbelievers will be tormented forever. When their skin is burned off, a fresh skin will be provided so that it can be burned off again. Allah will make disbelievers' lives miserable in this world and torture them forever after they die. Cut off the hands of thieves. It is an exemplary punishment from Allah. Now does that strike you as a linguistic and literacy and literary miracle? It sounds like the worst abomination of human rights abuses that you could conceive of. Now we're going to look at some scientific evidence. Now all religions claim that there is a God that's intervening in worldly affairs. That diagram shows the Christian view of how God is doing it. 
Science says, however, that there are four forces and they ultimately account for all that happens in the universe since the Big Bang. These are definite findings of science, well backed up again and again. And the point here is that there's no room for a God to intervene. Physics and religion are completely incompatible because there's nothing we've observed in the universe that has happened that cannot be accounted for by these four forces. There is no room for a God to intervene. So religion and science cannot both be true. If we look at medicine, Muhammad narrated, suddenly someone came to me and cut my body open from my throat to my pubic area and took my heart out and filled it with belief and returned it to its original place and so forth. Science says the heart is for pumping blood, not holding beliefs. Thinking occurs in the brain, not the heart, and surgery requires many procedures and precautions which were not known in the 7th century. So if you want to come to university and study medicine, how are you going to get from one to the other? You'll have to have two compartments in your brain. Islam and science are completely incompatible. Reproduction. Not just Islam, but other religions too. Christianity says a woman was made pregnant by a ghost. Science says human reproduction is commenced by the fertilizing of an egg by a sperm. And two sources of DNA are required. How could you study medicine at university if you believe that? Life and death. Christianity says a man died and three days later he rose from the dead. Science says the rate of decay within the human body after death is normally split into two distinct categories, autolysis and putrefaction and so forth. So therefore if you believe in the Quran you cannot study forensics. You're banned from that as well. Afterlives. Science says the mind is a function of the brain. It is entirely dependent on physical support systems. When the body dies, the mind stops. The diagram shows a, a brain there and um, some vital signs of the body coming to a sudden stop. Christianity says that unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. If, you, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life being maimed rather than having two hands go to hell, that the fire shall never be quenched. And Hindu says the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. Well, I am bewildered by such a change. And I, don't, and I believe that I am sober. Islam says those who believe in Allah do righteous good deeds and they are dwellers of paradise and they will dwell therein forever. And it goes on to give many references to paradise. There for them are pure companions, meaning virgins, there forever they abide. A sensual paradise where believing men are rewarded by being wed to 72 virgins, huris, with full grown, swelling or pear shaped breasts. The point here is that all religions contain some sort of afterlife. And given real knowledge that you would learn at a university, that's total nonsense from start to finish. Paleontology, the origins of humankind. Islam says your Lord created man out of a mere clot of congealed blood. Christianity says the Lord formed, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the man became a living creature. Science says the human species evolved from more primitive creatures and there's no supernatural involvement. You cannot hold both those ideas in the one brain unless you divide that brain into compartments in some way. Astronomy, again, the same things. Christianity and Islam say that the sun goes around the earth. Science says that the earth goes around the sun. Even Aristarchus knew that 2,000 years ago. So you can't study astronomy if you believe ancient superstitions. Can I ask a quick question? How many of you are students at a university in Australia? Would you like to indicate? Well, I'd like to find out later how you managed, whether you do manage to get these two ideas into your head at the same time, science and Islam. Now I'm going to move a bit to engineering, flight in a bit more detail. Now I used to teach aerospace engineering. I created my own courses. I've taught at four universities and I've had, I've have had hundreds of students from all backgrounds and I love teaching students and interacting with them. This is the slide from one of the courses I developed 
called Design of Space Vehicles, which I've given uh, about uh, 20 times. There's some of the topics, and there's a, there's a space vehicle taking off. Astro it covers things like astrodynamics, the space environment, rocket propulsion, the launch process, launch vehicle systems and design, spacecraft and their subsystems, space missions and payloads. So there, that covers a very wide variety of science. What does Christianity say about flight? As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually and in the midst of the fire as it were gleaming metal. When there arose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them. I heard the sound of wings like the sound of many waters. When they stood still, they let down their wings. That's the famous passage from Ezekiel, uh, which is attributed to UFOs. And there's an, an artist's rendition at the time showing someone watching the wheels, which is presumably the space vehicle, and the many-headed monster, which is presumably the alien that got out of the space vehicle. Now that is utter nonsense. It's an ancient superstition. Perhaps saying it's nonsense is too much. It simply reflects the knowledge around the, the time that was made. Now we look at Islam. Gabriel did take his servant for a journey by night from the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque, the famous night journey from the Quran. A white animal which was smaller than a mule but bigger than a donkey was brought to me, called a burak. The prophet said, the animal's step was so wide that it reached the farthest point within the reach of the animal's sight. In other words, it could step several kilometres, perhaps as far as the horizon. I was carried on it and Gabriel set out with me, Gabriel the archangel. So Muhammad was carried across his dominions by this flying creature which had a step several kilometres long or, or flew in the air. It's not quite clear. Utter nonsense in the light of present knowledge. This is completely incompatible with what you would learn at university. This is what I taught about what science teaches. Aeroplanes are held up by aerodynamic lift derived from wings moving through the air. And rockets are propelled by expelling a, a jet of gas from their engines. Now this much is known in this century, it was not known thousands of years ago, which of course explains why the religions come up with different explanations. So that's a real explanation of how the world works. And what we see in all of the holy books is simply not true. It's ancient superstitions. And if you believe what it says in the holy books, you will be severely handicapped at university. So there's a total conflict between religion, particularly Islam, and scientific knowledge. This applies to all fields of science, history, geography, and so forth. If you attempt to study at university while convinced that the Quran is true, you'll be very confused and handicapped. Now psychologists have a term for this called cognitive dissonance. Another term is the compartmentalised brain, where part of the brain might be believing what you were taught as a child about from some holy book, and the rest of your brain is trying to assimilate an entirely incompatible view of the world, perhaps from school or university. So, if you listen to the fundamentalist preachers, such as Hamza, you will be locked into beliefs from the Iron Age. You might as well return to live in a cave and you'll re-enter the dark ages. This is what the fundamentalists have in store for you. Now I'm going to look briefly about the historical record. We mentioned so far we've covered a fair bit of science, some areas that I'm familiar with and how that is totally incompatible with Islam. The historical record I see that Hamza likes a bit of humour, so that's great. I, that's something we can all share. So here's, uh, if we ask the question, why should any one God be more real than any other, then this is a view about how all religions started. Okay, here's how, here, here's how it works. First, you never question anything I tell you. That's the first thing then, because if you start questioning what the religion says, you'll quickly reject it. Now here's a chart on Christianity, which is supposed to be a monotheism, and yet they have a whole pantheon of gods. You can see they've got 
God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in the Trinity or the Triumvirate or the Oneness. We've got the Virgin Mary, we've got Satan, we've got saints such as Peter and Paul and the other apostles, we've got Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. All of these beings are claimed to be supernatural by Christianity, so they're gods of a sort. And we've got angels such as Gabriel and St. Michael, and we've got fallen angels such as Satan or Lucifer or Beelzebub. So this is the total confusion which religions would foist upon us. Now the origins of Islam, I'd like to acknowledge Steve Martin for providing this material. I've said before that all religions were started by individuals or groups of individuals. The historical record is very clear. Why would they do that? What would Muhammad have to gain from it? A united people, unquestioned authority and power. Laws and rules empowered and accredited his, his laws or rules to God, thus making them unquestionable. An invisible police force, very effective. Discipline and control over his people. Avert the blame for military loss and enrich his family and the Levite tribe. So certainly Muhammad had everything to gain through creating Islam, which he did. It greatly enabled him to conquer many lands. About not questioning it, every religion says you must, question the, must not question the beliefs. So the Bible, we see a number of quotes there from the Bible which says that you must not um, question it. And um, from the Quran, there are many times where it says you must not question it. So there are many quotations from the Bible there and from the Quran here. It says, He, God, cannot be questioned concerning what he does, and they, everyone else, shall be questioned. O ye who believe, do not put questions about things which, if declared to you, may trouble you. Because if you start putting questions, uh, the answers, you won't get the same answers as given in the Quran. Do not give to each other counsel of sin and revolt and disobedience to the apostle. So you're not allowed, every religion says you can't question them, which explains why they last so long in history. Now what was Muhammad? He was a warlord above all. His job was to conquer other tribes around them and extend his powers and dominion. And what would make soldiers fight harder? The promise of paradise. So he invented an afterlife, as did most religions. We saw in the scientific slides that nearly all religions have an afterlife, which is a way to make people sacrifice themselves in this life. Whosoever shall, shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. So if you lose your life fighting for Muhammad, you'll live on in an afterlife. Fear not them which kill the body, find paradise. And do not speak of those who are slain in Allah's way as dead. Nay, they are alive, but you do not perceive. So they're still alive, but you do not perceive them. That's a, frankly, it's nonsense, isn't it? And we've talked two minutes. Thank you. The 72 virgins is uh, one aspect we've covered. And the Bombay bombers, the Islamic bombers there, the suicide bombers, were on their phones being promised virgins in paradise to make them carry out their bombings, which they had doubts about. And in the Quran, paradise is mentioned 531 times. And if you didn't fight sufficiently well, you went to hell. And hell is mentioned 715 times in the Quran. Jesus gave instructions to kill non-believers. For example, think not that I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. And Muhammad said the same thing. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified or their hands or feet should be cut off on opposite sides. At least they'd be balanced, I suppose, if they've lost the left hand and the right foot. So there's some examples. Another saying from the Quran, Surely, as for those who believe, then disbelieve, again believe and again disbelieve, then increase in disbelief, Allah will not forgive them nor guide them in the right path. Which reminds me of Colin Powell who said, There are knowns. There are things that we know. There are, things, there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know we don't know. Well, I can't understand any of those. I'm very confused. So I'm going to stop there and conclude. Uh, in the next section, I'll look at what morality tells us. But I think so far we've shown that Islam and science meaning the broad view of science, meaning history and geography, are completely incompatible. 
And if you wish to study at university, you'll have to put your Islam beliefs into its own compartment or abandon them altogether. Thank you. A bit of silence, please. Sorry, my voice is a bit louder. Um, we're just going to call up Hamza now. It's 10 minute presentations each. So, first, again, with the affirmative, Hamza, and then Ian will give his next 10 minute presentation um, following that. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot to go through. Firstly, I think I know where our beloved interlocutor studied. I think he went to the University of Google <laughs> and, uh, and to the College of YouTube. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address uh, this poor man's soul in the appropriate way, which is hopefully with a bit of morality. But let me go through all of his points. I've written every single one down. Number one, Islam and science. Straw man, red herring, smelly fish. Basically, essentially, concerning science, let's go to the historians of science. David C. Limburg, he says that the scientific method was produced by whom? It was a Muslim. His name was Ibn al-Haytham. He wrote the book on optics. It was the first manifestation of a former method of the scientific method. Prophet Thomas Arnold says, if it wasn't for Islamic Spain that was influenced by Islamic culture, that was influenced by the Quran to look into the internet, interconnecting principles of nature, we wouldn't have the Renaissance. If you never had the Renaissance, you wouldn't be living in Australia. Second point, second point, he says the weak point is actually Muhammad upon whom be peace. The claim just went to Muhammad, it's very unscientific. Again, a straw man, it's a logical fallacy, he's misrepresented the argument. Essentially, what, the, what Muhammad upon whom be peace brought was the Quran itself. And it gives you a challenge. There's a falsification test there. It's not as if we have just to believe what he said. He brought this miracle and he says, if you don't believe this is not true, then challenge it. Again, another straw man. Number three, he, he read English translations of the Quranic dis discourse saying, that's not great literature. Uh, the Quran's in Arabic. It's an Arabic miracle. <laughs> this one is the best one. It shows that he has no understanding of philosophy, of logic, of reason. I mean, it looks like he came from the cave. Listen to this one. Listen to this one. Listen to this one. He said, intervening God, it's impossible. We have the four forces of nature. We know how things happen. Yes, I know that. But you're conflating the how with the why. You're making them say the same. We know how things happen. Yes, we believe as Muslims. It's the forces of nature. Even that classical tradition said there were some physical causes. But why? is the kind of religious dimension that unfortunately science can't really entertain. So you're conflating the how with the why. Then you said the hadith on the heart, it came out, it was clean, it's irrational. This is a miracle, this is a spiritual metaphysical issue. Why are you reducing everything to your empirical paradigm? It's outside of your empirical paradigm. The next point, Islam says that, rather Christianity says something about embryology. And you see what he does, he's equivocating Christianity with Islam, it's different, two different things. Because Islam actually says, Nutfa and Amsaj. What's Amsaj? A intermingling of fluids, and from the male and the female. So do your reading please. Then you talk about Christianity and miracles. Well, this is Islam. Christianity and Islam are different things, so you have to appreciate that. Then he said about the afterlife. We know now in science that the mind and brain is interconnected. The brain dies, the mind dies. I mean, this is the most shallow, unacademic, unnuanced thing I've ever read in my life concerning neuroscience. I mean, I was willing to just jump up and say, Eureka, please shut up. Because I'm not being bad. If we study a very basic 14-year-old book on consciousness, we would know there's a thing called the hard problem of consciousness, which, as Professor David Sharma says, that we don't have a physicalist, materialistic, empirical answer for this. We have to now claim other properties for the universe which are unseen, metaphysical, conscious properties. It's not just directly correlated to the material brain. Please evolve your reading from 1970s. 
Now, again, more Christianity is wrong. Then he said, man was created from congealed blood. Again, English translation, the word is alaqa. It could also mean something that clings. And we know, according to many modern embryologists like John Allen and Beverly Kramer, what do they describe the embryo to be? Something that clings on the connecting stalk. Let's read our medicine. Then he says, the sun around the earth. Did everyone read the verse? Did it say the sun around the earth in that verse? Did it say that? He's reading into the Quran. He's the fundamentalist. So, oh, then he gave another Christian example. Red herring, straw man, illogical. Then he says the night journey. We know things work with rockets and energy. Well, the horse, Burak, was a metaphysical, miraculous thing. We believe in miracles. You have to disprove that miracles are incoherent philosophically for you to have a justification for your claim. We never claimed it was a physical and empirical reality. Then you said there's too many gods. Which one are we going to choose? Um, well, the one that we have proof for, like I gave you proof of the Quran and you haven't dismantled it. Next point, Muhammad upon who be peace, what did he have to gain? He gained all this power. This is a quote mining, misreading, a non-reading, a borrowing from some stu steward, whoever his name is, and not even doing the reading yourself. Muhammad upon who be peace for the first 13 years, tortured, abused. He was so hungry, he tied two stones to his stomach. He was stoned by children for hours. His blood was running down his leg. The sandals were stuck to the sand. He was, his, his wife passed away. His uncle passed away. His companions were tortured and abused. And he's saying, for gain? Even when he gained military power, what was it for? He had no smoke coming out of his house for months or years because he couldn't afford food. He would live on dates and water. And you said he has something to gain? That's the biggest misreading. It's like saying, for example, reading Hamlet, and it says, to be or not to be, whether it's noble in the mind of man to withstand the slings and arrows of Rachel's fortune or to, bear, or to take up arms and whatever. It's like saying Hamlet was a jihadist just by reading that. And then you said, one minute, then you said he was a war, one second, then you said he was a warlord. Yes, he didn't go to war. For humanity, for peace and justice and mercy. That's why the Jews in history, read your history, my friend. The Jews, like Zion Zohar, the academic in Safari Jewry, he said thus, when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and Iberian Peninsula, the Jews saw the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. We had Einar Hagrads, a 19th century Jewish historian, saying what? that the Jews lived favorably under the Mohammedans. You had in 1453 a book on Constantinople, a primary source from a rabbi. He's saying to his brethren, Jews come to the land of the Muslims, the Turks. Rich are the fruits of the earth, we're not oppressed with heavy taxes. The Jacobites that were pressed under the Orthodox tradition, the Byzantiums, they were being tortured and killed by their own Christian people. They were calling the Muslims to come because they were the real liberators. So it was about justice and mercy, he wasn't a warlord. Also you talk about Islamic bombers, what a cheap shot. Cheap shot. Do your reading, if you can read. <laughs> because, because, let me tell you why. And I'm not being rude because he's, he's come out with cliches, with outdated cliches. And let me just tell you something, if you read the history in the past two centuries, 80 million people plus in the name of secularism, not in the name of religion. The past two centuries, has, there's been more blood in the name of non-religious ideology than any other religious ideology. I would challenge anybody until the cows or the sheep come home. <laughs> Finally, brothers and sisters and friends, this is the first time I've addressed every single point. <laughs> Finally, he quotes Surah 5, 33-34 that whoever rages war against Allah and his messenger then you either exile them or, or cut the hand, the feet, etc. Do you know what this is in Islamic jurisprudence? Have you read a basic book on Islamic jurisprudence? I will guarantee you haven't. Because this verse is about Hiraba, the criminal code called Hiraba. Do you know what Hiraba means? Terrorism. This verse is against terrorism. It's, the, it's actually the punishment for terrorists. That's the irony. So, and it includes higher robbery and rape. Because if you rape a woman, you don't need four witnesses by the way. DNA in her testimony is enough. You have a very severe punishment. In the secular West, you get more for stealing and less for raping. God bless you. And again, uh, I won't waste any time. Uh, Ian, feel free to come up and address 
the audience with your 10 minute presentation. Okay, thank you. I'll now give my second part of the presentation. I'm still looking for one decent argument from Hansa. We see lots of shouting and yelling and ranting and raving, but no actual facts. Hamza speaks a fair bit about deductive logic, but he should know that no amount of logic can substitute for observations about the real world. In any logical system, whether it's deductive or inductive, you can you use a system of reasoning to reach a conclusion, but what's missing is the starting premises. The reasoning only starts if you've got some premises at the beginning. And if you're going to reach a conclusion about the real world, you need observations about the real world. There's a saying about arguments that if there's no armadillos in the premises, there can be no armadillos in the conclusion. The faulty sort of argument is illustrated by the case where you argue that the moon is made of green cheese. You can prove anything from, an, from a false assumption. So, when Hamza argues about the universe and science, what's missing is observations about the real world. Science is based entirely on observations of the real world, not about rhetoric and argument. So that's where it falls down. But now we're going to move on to part two, which is what morality tells us. Now there's a very long list of atrocities of every type committed by fundamentalists. I haven't got time to go through them or even start, so we're going to look at some currently in the news. For example, Bacha Posh, the dressing of girls as boys in Afghanistan, some areas of Islamic Afghanistan. If a family has only daughters, then they're in shame because they need a son, so they invent a son. They get one of the girls and dress her up as a boy, to play as a boy and masquerade as a boy. And at puberty, they turn that boy back to a girl. And... Um, she then has to behave as a woman. In other words, she has to, ask, have to, has to start acting very subservient, even though she's been brought up as a boy. And this demonstrates the inferiority of women in these cultures, the inequality of women. The secular party, I should have said at the beginning, stands for universal values like equality and honesty and justice and freedom. And equality means equality of all people. We don't ask the women to sit on one side of the room and the men on the other, like they did tonight. The same is happening in Afghanistan when they, they feel the need for a boy, so they dress a girl up as a boy. Because, uh, and this is based on the Koran and the teachings for 1400 years. And we believe it's a gross violation of human rights and it causes great suffering when they have to change back. Permanent psychological damage. And it hasn't been redressed in 1400 years because Islam can't be questioned. Leaving a belief systems. Most religions threaten to punish anyone leaving the faith, and Islam is very much the worst there. If you um, leave your Islam faith, you can be stoned to death in, according to Sharia law. And that's hand, been handed down for 1400 years and is still the case in many countries. If you compare that with free thought systems, such as those espoused by the secular party and the humanists and city atheists and so forth, then you're encouraged to think for yourself. And if you reach a conclusion that differs from everyone else, then good luck to you. It's all the better if you can defend it and discuss it. So there's a very big difference. Segregation of sexes. Security expert Professor Anthony Glees of um, a university in the UK, Berkshire, I think, said that students, Berkeley I should say, no, Berkshire, said students' rights research indicates that there is a failing in our higher education system. We can and should stop radicalisation on campus by extremists who believe in segregation. Otherwise, more students and graduates will eventually embrace terror. He added, terrorists are not born, they are made. Well, in this very venue, we see attempted segregation of men and women. 
which again reinforces the indoctrination of young people into Islamic beliefs, which defy all basic human rights of equality. The Kenya Mall atrocity, very recent, 69 dead so far. The Somali militant group, Al-Shabaab, said it carried out the attack. Witnesses said the gunman at the Westgate tried to identify Muslims by asking shoppers the name of Muhammad's mother. Those who didn't know got shot. Is that the sort of thing we want in this country? This illustrates the fact that the Quran says it is okay to kill infidels. Fundamentalist Islam has a continuous history of doing so ever since, and is still doing it today. And what I want to know is where are the decent Muslims protesting against this? The silence is deafening. Subjugation and terrorist organisations. Muslims living in, um, among non-Muslims. That was detailed in the Quran and the Hadiths. You've got three options. Convert them to Islam, kill them, or conquer them and submit them to dimitude, which is a form of slavery. Now dimitude involves subjugation, taking total control of them. It has elements of slavery. Rape is permitted if there is any revolt and they have no say in government. And it is compulsory. It's detailed in the Quran. It's been practiced throughout history by Islamic extremists, by the hardline Islamists. It's espoused by modern Islamist groups. And what they want to do is install a caliphate, which in includes Sharia law, and then the non-Muslims become dhimmis. And there's a new generation of extremists preaching at British universities, and it's clear that they're trying to, they would, their ultimate aim is to install dimitude. We, we, we met Professor Anthony Glees before, and he's uh, failing in the higher education system. We had that quote before. Now there's another group called Hizbut Tahrir. Now this was formed in 1953 and is a group seeking to impose Islamic states or caliphates rules by Islamic law with a caliph as the head of state elected only by Muslims. Treatment of apostates. The draft constitution declares that Muslims who have by themselves renounced Islam are guilty of apostasy and are to be executed. This is from their draft constitution. Treatment of infidels, including Australians. Non-Muslims in a Muslim country become dhimmis, dominated and denied any role in government. Couldn't happen in Australia, could it? Here's what Tahrir in Australia. You can visit their website. It says Muslims rise, caliphate imminent. So their aim is to overthrow the government of Australia and convert it to an Islamic government. And their spokesman, Wasim Duri, I don't know whether he's here tonight, but I would like to ask Hamza whether he has been in touch with this group since he's been in Australia. <laughs> now, freedom of speech. What do we think about freedom of speech? This is something that Hamza Tsouris sort of said in 2008. We as Muslims reject the idea of freedom of speech, even the idea of freedom. So Hamza, does this mean that you want to, if you have your way, you would muzzle me and murder me? You're a liar. Or lock me up? You're a liar. This is from your website, sir. No, it's not. Why would I put that on my own website? <laughs> you're a liar, just like your colleague who said there's no knowledge in Islam when it's mentioned a hundred times in the Quran. This is lies, this is deceitful, and I'm glad you're not a politician. I'm glad you're irrelevant in this society considering politics. This is immoral. I got this. Is this or is this not on your website? It's not on my website. I've seen this on your website. about me. There's a difference. Can we read? Come on, man. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that fundamentalist Islam is completely incompatible with science and other knowledge. The historical record shows that Islam and most religions were invented by individuals or groups to extend their power, wealth and influence. Religions, particularly Islam, have the worst human rights record. This cannot change as long as we are not allowed to question Islam. Islamist organisations are dedicated to establishing caliphates and dimitude, 
which is a form of slavery, around the world. And many Islamists in Australia and universities and here tonight have such designs on Australia. Thank you. I've already given an argument that it's not based on any observations of the real world. They're, de they're simple deductive arguments which are as faulty as the premises. So that the knowledge we do have about the real world is based on physics and okay. observations of the, the world as it is now and the, the record, the scientific record. Sure. I thought I was talking there because what you're saying is untrue because if you understand the premises as well, the world is deductive in nature. Having a deductive argument doesn't necessarily mean it's not based on reality. I mean, if you don't believe in deduction, then you're supposed to be a physicist, you don't believe in mathematics, those are deductive abstract truths. Second point you need to understand is, well, we have a lot of different data to justify the beginning of the universe. Alexander Belenkin, one of the leading theorists of cosmology, says that we can't run away from a cosmic beginning. Does it take the spatio-temporal boundary, t is equal to zero? Okay, we have various conceptions, I know that academia says there's not just one opinion, but we have suggested evidence empirically. So how can you say this in a blase way? I, I don't understand, we don't have any evidence from the beginning of the universe itself. Okay, well it's quite simple. We cannot do any observations before t equals zero. And that includes any observations of a possible creator. That's nothing but speculation. Okay, let me address that. What you've assumed is what you call a very crude empiricism. Empiricism is a theory of knowledge that basically asserts that you need direct and indirect observation to form conclusions about reality. But the point here is there are so many things that are not directly observed. Even in science you have highly complex theoretical constructs and structures like the atom, like, like, like particles, like so many different things. You have correlations, you have energy correlations. The point is, you don't have direct observations for the things that you would believe to be doing in your own physics. So why, on one hand, you have a very crude empiricism when it comes to religious matters and metaphysics, but on the other hand, you expand the scope of empiricism when it comes to what you think is non-religiously related. And I think that's, that's a false use of empiricism mm -hmm. because if you study empiricism, you do the works of John Cunningham and his book Rationalism, you're basically saying that, look, you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't just demand direct observation. And when it comes to religion, well, you know, do you see my point? So I, I think what you're addressing is a bit of a red herring. But I want, I want you to actually deal with the premises, even if it's deductive, even if it's deductive. Deal with it, because being deductive doesn't mean it's not true. So I want you to deal with the premises of the argument. The universe began, we could show this from a mathematical, philosophical and empirical dimension. We have those sorts of possibilities. Address the premises. Okay, the universe began, that's an observation, yes. It certainly doesn't come from the Quran, that comes from science. So the Quran has nothing to say about how the universe began. It does actually, you sure you haven't read the Quran. Nothing testable, no. Divine because we can prove it's 
miracle with the linguistic miracle of the other things I spoke about. But he has an assertion, the universe began, God created the cosmos, that's an assertion, it's in line with the miracle and deductive reality. So it makes that point. Now this, so this the point is, if it makes that point, it gives us four logical conclusions as well. By the way, the logic I gave you is Quranic. Chapter 52. Excuse me. The, I, I thought the idea was that you asked me questions and I answered them for 10 minutes. It seems to me you've got it back to front. You ask the questions for 10 minutes and then I don't get to answer them. But your answer is not sufficient. What I said before remains true. If there's no armadillos in the premises, there can be no armadillos in the conclusions. So if, what do you mean by that? So if Quranic science or Islamic science makes no observations of the real world, it can't reach any conclusions about the real world. Okay, may I answer it? We have four possibilities. Address these two things. You either have to reject the beginning of the universe and go back to no. the 1950s, or you have to reject <laughs> the logic. The point is, you need to address these two things. Talking about the Quran is a bit of a red herring. Address the premise. Did the universe begin? Excuse me, yeah. would you like me to answer it, or would you like me to just listen to you answer it you yourself? Know what I'm saying? The question I have to repeat many times, sir. <laughs> okay, well, there are no gods in the premises because no god has ever been observed. Full stop. Therefore, there can be no gods in the conclusions. Is that simple enough for you? No, that's, that's terrible. Terrible. <laughs> Listen to this. It's true, however. So are you saying to me that indirect observation, indirect kind of evidence is not suitable evidence to claim that... You it is not right? evidence at all. Excuse me. This, this little argument, we repeat for you if you haven't understood it. The universe began, it could either come from nothing, create itself, be ultimately created by something else created, or ultimately created by something else that's uncreated, okay? So the point is, we address... No. Let me finish. That doesn't, that doesn't address any of the theories of the origin of the universe. You're just making those up. There's no science in them whatsoever. There's no? There's no science in those conjectures whatsoever. I'm so sorry. You either haven't understood the logic or the science. Have you read Professor Kass's book, The Universe from Nothing? Of course, I own it. The universe came from nothing, so the science trying to justify its conclusion. Have you read Alexander Vilenkin's book? <laughs> The point is that it's in their works. So how can you say there's no science when they actually address some of these issues themselves? Let me explain again. There is no God, no element of a God has ever been observed in the real world. Okay, that's, that's my premise. Therefore, there can be no God in the conclusions. Despite any amount of clever reasoning and deductive logic that you might wish to go to put forth, if there's no God in the observations, or the premises, there can be no God in the conclusions. Okay. Full stop. Therefore, your argument falls right down. Hey, your logic. Let me see how your logic can be applied to reality. There's no observation of my great, 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 great grandmother. Therefore, my great, great, great grandmother never existed. <laughs> would you like me to answer that, or would you like to answer it yourself? I shall. There are many observations of your great 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 grandfather, and many of them survived through the historical record. Where? That is real evidence. Where? Where? I don't have his grave or his DNA or photos. There are many documents. There are documents going back to <laughs> 2000. Excuse, excuse me, Hamza. I thought we were asked to be courteous to each other, which would include allowing me to answer questions without you interrupting. Let's go to another example. Julius Caesar. Yes. There are many physical traces of Julius Caesar. There are, fo there, are, there are paintings and there are drawings and there are busts and there are recorded speeches. So there's lots of evidence that he existed. But there is evidence that he existed. What is this? You. That's very good, Hamza. You deny the evidence exists and you are the evidence yourself. So okay. does this mean you don't exist according you to your logic? Let's address the God existence issue. Let's, make it, let's go to the Quran, which you obviously haven't read. You have to borrow stuff from John or Stuart or whatever his name is. Right. The Quranic issue. Well, saying having a book doesn't mean you read it. I've got many books. Now, let me tell you something. My argument was, first I defined what miracle was, then I said that there's a literal linguistic miracle, and I talk about the numerical consonants. Please address that premise if you can. 
And if you misinterpret it, I'll have to... Can you repeat that more slowly, please? Please, can you address the premise of the argument that I used for the Qur'an, which I defined when miracle was an Islamic spiritual, philosophical, theological tradition. Then I also spoke about the fact that the Qur'an is a history okay. miracle. It's an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature. There is no physical causal link. There's no physical causal link between the literary form of the Arabic and the Arabic language itself. There's no naturalistic explanations. It's a sign of to the supernatural. And I also spoke about that. We have, a, we have no naturalistic explanation for the numerical consonants, coherence in the, in the Quranic discourse, especially since it was written over 23 years period for specific times and places. To say that it was from a man is to say that he actually knew the future. So I want you to address those issues. So, the response, and then um, that's it. Sure. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you're confusing an absence of evidence with evidence of absence. You're saying that you don't, you've never seen any evidence that accounts for the expressions of the Quran as we read them today. Therefore, there is an absence of the Quran. That doesn't follow at all. All it means is that your knowledge is incomplete, which is natural because you weren't there at the time. So again, your argument doesn't stand up at all. And uh, an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Thank you for that. Thank you for the lovely exchange between Hamza and Ian. Now it's Ian's turn to cross-examinate. So Ian will be asking questions this time and uh, have them respond. The way it works is up until the 10 minutes, the question can be asked after that. Thank you. Well, I'll return to my first theme of the Quran versus science. And like, I'd like to ask Hamza, when you came to Australia for this debate, did you travel on an aeroplane that was designed by scientific principles or Quranic principles? Would you like to? <laughs> because in order to design a plane, you need an impetus for that, some kind of motivation. Now, for example, maybe the engineers have various motivations. Like for, as a religious person, when you read the Quranic discourse, you can't just sit at home. You have to go and do something. It's only to explore and investigate. I mean, if you look at Islamic history, you see that, for example, who were the pioneers of medicine? Ibn Sina, you know, the kind of medicine that was used in Europe for 600 years because the Prophet Muhammad upon him he said for every disease is a cure so search for the cure we have motivations they don't have to be secular motivations to you so the, the, the impetus for these things that actually could be Quranic as well so I, I don't see the dichotomy there thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. next question a friend of mine went with her husband to Dubai where they were caught, the husband was caught up in a property scam and was detained in Dubai for four years as a potential witness in the trial. Now, according to any sort of international law, he would have been allowed, he wouldn't have been imprisoned for four years. And as it turned out, he was tried himself and found not guilty, but he's still kept locked up there uh, for no one knows whatever reason, because Shiramic, uh, Sharia law is operating there. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, it's depriving them of their liberty, these innocent people. Another case is that there, a Swedish woman in Dubai was raped by the hotel staff. She was advised not to go to the police, the Islamic police, but she did. Okay. And she got imprisoned for rape. Now, I haven't heard you speak out against these outrages against human rights. Why is that? Dubai hasn't got Sharia law in place. The example you've given about Afghanistan, about all these other places, is the very fact that we Muslims had the Arab Spring with their dictators, their despots, they don't represent our tradition. We talk about this day in and day out. What you have to say is the biggest straw man misrepresentation I've ever heard, ever. You think we agree with being someone being imprisoned innocently for four years? You think that's our tradition? I want to challenge you. You find me a prophetic tradition or Quranic verse that justifies what Dubai is. If you can't do that, then you, that's shallow scholarship and you just looked at BBC or Fox News or Googleisms 
and you just threw it against Islam because it happens to be a Muslim country. That's terribly unfair. Terribly unfair. For example, in the Islamic tradition, we believe in minority rights, we believe in justice, we believe in judiciary, in, in truth, in accountability, in so many different political realities that are actually create a just and harmonious society. And what you're doing there is terribly unfair. And it's, it, in a way, it, it lacks depth and scholarship because Dubai is not an Islamic state. It's a kingdom. They have kings. They have rulers who don't represent Islam. For example, the whole economic model is not on the Islamic economic model. So, in actual fact, what you're saying there is case against secularism, not case against Islam, because they're secular in, in origin. <laughs> There's a vast Islamic majority in Dubai, and that's the laws that they put in place. No, it's not. I'll ask you another question. In many countries, in Islamic countries, girls as young as eight get sold into marriage with a much older man. Now, in enlightened countries such as Australia, we don't allow women under 18 years of age to give consent for sex because they are not fully mature and are not able to make up their own mind. And so can you tell me your views on that, please? Does that make it rape in all of these Islamic countries that practice this tradition? But I haven't heard you speaking up against well, it. Well, if you spoke with your colleague that had a debate with a few days ago, you would see that I actually agree with you. Because Islamic principle is based on the following. Number one, no harm. Number two, physically fit. Number three, mentally fit. Number four, social acceptance. You apply those principles you get different ages because we don't have a silly incoherent law we just put a number. It's unjust. You put principles. And sometimes you may be 18, you may happen to be 14, you may be 30. I mean, there's some people, you know, especially when I'm from in England, they kind of tie their students at 18, their mothers to each other, they're not ready for the marriage, yeah? So the point is, they're not meant to be fit. So the point is, our law is a principled law. We don't say, here's a number. Go beyond that, it's wrong. Because this exposes your secularism. Let me explain why. In Greece, you can marry, I believe, 13. Spain, 12. America, 21. Other places, 16. Other places, 14. England, 16. Even in secular states, they differ. So I get married in one place, I'm a pedophile in another place. So it's exposed. It actually exposes your law. You, what you've done, you think a great, you know what, you should be on my side. <laughs> Unfortunately, unfortunately, Hamza, when I lecture at university, I have to tell the truth. And I go to great lengths to make sure what I'm telling is the truth. And in fact, the Islamic countries have a, around the world have a great tradition of forcing their children into underage marriage. Does it mean it's Islam? Does it mean it's Islam? The Quran says, for example, that a man has the right to have sex with his woman how and when he chooses, in the same way that he can plough his field how and when he chooses. Now there's no equality there, there's no justice there. It's a simple male domination, removing the rights of women. It's not an Islamic law, my wife could divorce me if I'm not satisfying you. Babe, you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know I don't believe that. You know, you no. It's proof that you go to the University of Google and the College of YouTube. If you want to have a sincere discussion with the Muslim community, and this is really sincere advice, Wallahi, by Allah, it's sincere advice, by God. But the society... I know you're not a bad guy, you're a nice guy. But what's happening here, you're putting a personality across. And the word personality comes from the word persona in Latin, which means a mask. Let's remove the mask. Can we address the question, please? I, am, I do it eloquently in my Greek way. Now, <laughs> <laughs> and the point I'm trying to say is this. If you want to engage with the Muslim community, at least have the intellectual, epistemic justice and duty to read a basic book. Because if you read about Islamic jurisprudence, you see that the laws for the wife concerning sexual rights are very high. It's the same as the man. They both have to please each other. You know there's a prophetic hadith. But the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, I'm answering the question. He said, do not go to your wives just like you know, animals. Make sure you have things like, I'm sorry for the crudeness, it's part of the religion. Foreplay. Make sure you make her enjoy it and make sure that she has an orgasm. Go to the website, Muslim Matters. It's a famous Islamic blog. They have a many part series on sexual rights of women, which are, are, are fantastic. We're in secular society, in a liberal society, they allow pornography, which is male dominated. The woman always has to please the men. If you study, 
For example, Dana E. Russell, she works in Oxford uh, publications and other feminists, they say in a pornographic society, especially even in Australia where you allow things like prostitution and escort service, it's all to do with the pleasure of the man. But Islam says, no, it's the pleasure of the woman or she could divorce no. you. How dare you say something about Islam when you have the problem in your Hamza, life? that is nonsense. No, it's not, it's the Quran and the Hadiths and the, the practices ever since are entirely devoted towards the pleasure and the rights of the male, with nothing towards the female. Why do you use evidence? You're just making a claim. I said there's You're not showing me any evidence. I'm saying the Prophet Muhammad said, upon whom be peace, that the you actually do things like foreplay, that you make sure that she's satisfied in bed. Is that evidence for you? Or do you want to say what Muhammad said? He also said that you can treat her the same as you would a cow, you can, or a field. <laughs> You can plough her how and when you want, as if she was a field, a tilt, it's called you know in the Quran. Yes? If you know the word Arabic, you know what it means? Basically, the Quran also says that we are garments of each other. You know when you have a garment, it's like you feel warm and you're close and you're intimate. It's, ima it's imagery, it's imaginistic language. Now, if you go to the, the Arabic, basically it means, don't think that pleasing her is just basically penetration. Pleasing her is everywhere. That's the point. But the point, is, finish, the point is, the point is, Hamza, no, you're straying off the question. No, you are misreading the Quranic text. Because the Quranic text is telling us to ensure that the woman is pleased, and therefore don't crush on one area, crush on all areas. It's actually <laughs> the a problem is, modern document from that perspective. The problem yeah. is, you can please her whether she wants it or not. No. She doesn't have any say in it. Look, the Prophet Muhammad upon you said, there is no harming and no reciprocal. Anyway, I'd like to move on. No, because you're not, an you're not answering it. <laughs> so the next question is, the Sharia law says very clearly that when a, when a woman reaches a certain age, if they divorce, the, the man can divorce, divorce her simply by sending a message three times, or saying a phrase three times. Is that correct? This, this, is, the, sorry, this is the last question. Okay. Yet a woman has no such rights. And once the children reach a certain age, the man gets all the property. The woman is left with nothing. I was involved, when I visited Nepal, I was part of a delegation to write part of a new constitution for them. <laughs> and that, that covered many countries in the region, including Bangladesh and India, which have Islamic populations. And then one of the major concerns was the property rights of Islamic women. Sorry, we're talking about Islamic customs, not the ruler of the day. The Islamic customs are very clear that women are treated as property, as very inferior beings, and that cuts right against all human rights that I stand for. The question the was the treatment of women in Islamic society, not your brother. You know what? Ask the women. They'll put you in your place. Go ask. Not talk to me. I'm not a woman. Ask the women. You we tell me they have they are emancipated. They are they are they are they don't have to pay for their education. They don't have to pay the food or the clothing, they don't have to pay for the own makeup. You tell that to David Cameron. You tell that to David Cameron who has eighty thousand homeless people. Uh, homeless women and women are not going to prostitution because of no money. In an Islamic state, a woman is an honor. She is an honor. She needs to be protected and she has food, shelter, and clothing. In Australia, you have people go to Perth, go to Brisbane. You have the Aborigines, women who are drunk and destitute on the roads because of the secular system. Very cheap. Very cheap. <laughs>
All right, quiet, please. We'll now have five-minute conclusion from each speaker. Um, there will be no exceeding time uh, for any reason. So five minutes, Hamza, for the four, and five minutes, Ian, for the against. So please, Hamza. I mean, to be honest, I've uh, made up my mind, and I think I'm really looking forward to engaging with the audience, because I hope the audience is far more nuanced and doesn't refer to Google and things that even Muslims disagree with, with countries that we believe are not Islamic in any shape or form. If you go to the constitution of Bangladesh, it borrows things from Britain and other places. So it doesn't have an Islamic constitution or a basis from that perspective. But I think, just to end, I think what we need to understand is our arguments are strong. As we could see with the great-grandfather and great-grandmother example, we see that his epistemology is incoherent. Epistemology means how to get to know things. But I don't want to use this five minutes just to have a bash, I just want to talk to you directly and not to the inter interlocutor. We are cosmic orphan, okay? We have existential questions, questions like what does it mean to exist? Who am I? Why am I? Whose am I? For whom am I? And sometimes, many of you on a Friday night, where am I? <laughs> so the point here is, my beloved brothers, sisters and friends in humanity, that these questions sometimes need to be answered so we could be tranquil. And I think today should be a window of opportunity, whether an intellectual one or a spiritual one, for you to open that window of opportunity, to engage with the Islamic discourse in ways that you haven't done before. And I do believe that you're going to transcend the outdated cliches of our beloved interlocutor, and you're going to transcend the outdated cliches, and actually really want to engage with the tradition, because everything he has said doesn't have a basis in the Islamic doctrine. He hasn't gone and given me the evidence, and if he has given evidence one or two, they've been quote mining, not understanding the context. Just like you're reading Hamlet and thinking that Shakespeare was a jihadist or something. So, what I want everyone to do, and I know my personality hasn't come across that way, but again, let's blame the Greekness for a minute. What I want you guys to do is really take a step back and think, okay, look, we've heard interesting, it was a bit of fun, we had a bit of banter, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is quite severe and has severe implications especially from a religious perspective, because we believe in an afterlife, and you have either divine alienation, which is punishment, or eternal bliss. And you have been given the gift of free choice for you to investigate. You've heard some things that you may have never heard before today. So follow the prophetic guidance of Muhammad upon whom peace, even if you don't believe in him, when he said, the cure to ignorance is to ask and learn. So I want you to proceed in that light in the Q&A. Also, follow the Quranic discourse when the Quran tells us to reflect to ponder and to think because the book is a book for humanity it's, I believe it's not just for me it's not a sectarian thing it's not something that you know gives me a sense of identity you know I had a great humanist secular life with my parents it's to do with truth it's to do with thought and looking beyond the cliches and going to Google and it's very important for us to do this because now is a time when a juncture in humanity that we can't be doing this all the time because if you go to my library, I have books on secularism. John Stuart Mill, I have all the original books based on secular philosophy and atheistic thought. And it's unfortunate that he probably hasn't, have, he hasn't read the source text of Sharia law or any base document because it's evident in his approach. But at least we believe as Muslims, we have a, a just epistemic duty to knowledge to understand who you are. But please, please, and I'm being very serious, understand who we are. I can't be giving you evidence about the Prophet Muhammad upon him is what he said and then you to tell me that's not evidence, he didn't say that and you're making things up. You, can't you see this is clear as day. Let's connect with one another, let's not pre-frame each other and I believe we'll have a very good Q&A and may God bless you. Assalamu alaikum. And for five minutes we have uh, Ian now to conclude, uh, after this we'll have the Q&A uh, session. Thank you. Okay, well for my concluding remarks, I'd like to firstly remind you that all through my engineering career and all through my university lecturing, I have been held accountable for the truth that's very important to me. Everything I say has to be traceable and backed up and accurate. 
So, th so uh, everything I've said today, I believe, has been the truth, and if you wish to dispute it, dispute it then you can ask me in Q&A. Now, I'll summarise a little bit about the history of religion again. I just remember the model I gave where each religion was invented by an individual or a group with the idea of gaining power in some form or other over their fellow men. And I'll give you some examples here. For example, this little book is called The Bhagavad Gita. And it forms the basis for the Hindu religion. And it's their version of, of uh, the origins of the universe and how men should live. And um, that says things like the soul simultaneously passes into another body at death. Well, that's an ancient tradition which science has shown to be false. We have another book here, the Bible, which of course includes the Old Testament, written many thousands of years ago, gathering together the ancient myths of the day, and the New Testament about the life of Jesus and his followers. Again, clearly written by groups of people with the aim of gaining power. We have here another book called the Quran, which as we saw has also been written by an individual called Muhammad in about the year 623. Well, not written by him, but dictated by him. Again, with the purpose of gaining power, as we saw in some detail. We have another one here called the Dao Di Ching, which is written by Lao Tzu, which was the basis of Taoism and Confucius writings. Now, I could go on, I could talk about, for example, Mary Baker Eddy and um, Christ, so-called Christian science. I could talk about L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. I could talk about the Book of Mormon and so on. All of these followed the same pattern. An individual or group invented a religion in order to gain power. And some were more or less successful uh, than others. And Islam is no different. Science has shown all of the claims in their holy books where they make specific claims about the real world the claims to be wrong. It reflected the knowledge of the day when the book was written. It does not reflect the reality. So one is forced to the conclusion that either their God didn't know how the universe works or their God did not exist. And the same is true of Islam. We've heard of absolutely, there's absolutely nothing in the Quran that gives any indication of any knowledge about the world which was not in possession of the people of the day. Science, on the other hand, we have people standing on the shoulders of other people making discoveries that advance on their discoveries. I showed you a slide earlier which showed a, a chain of deduction and reasoning and scientific development and that is what we know about the real world. So in summary, religions are all ancient traditions, Islam included. They were created by individuals and they tell us nothing about the real world and they can be particularly harmful as we've seen about the human rights record and that's why we should oppose them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's, that's an excellent question. Okay, my view is that facts about the real world rely on observable evidence and questions of human rights are a matter of choice. So therefore they're not in the same category as scientific truths. For example, if we say that the moon is so many thousand kilometres away, that's physical evidence and that can be tested and observed. If we say that women should be treated equal to men, that's not a fact about the universe. That is an opinion, and I'm the first to admit that. Um, having said that, I'll say that the secular party and the other atheist groups that I've mentioned from time to time um, have chosen to adopt universal human rights based on principles. The first, if you like, a core principle, it could be the sentience of intelligent beings. For example, human beings, to take the simpl simplest example, that all humans have equal rights and we should respect the wishes and the welfare of all humans. 
And that is a principle which can't be proven by observation. It's a principle which we freely admit that we've adopted voluntarily. And from that you can use scientific evidence to flow on to see how we should treat people. And one of the ways we should treat people is to make sure that men and women are treated equally. I think, does that answer your question? And therefore, God doesn't exist, <laughs> or therefore, Islam is not true. I mean, in a way, it's another bit of a red herring concerning this topic today, because when we talk about things to do with interpretation, it doesn't actually deny the fact that that book has a certain source. For example, you know, we know Shakespeare probably most likely have to have written Romeo and Juliet, but you have different. If you study English literature, you see there's different kind of literary analyses of Romeo and Juliet. Just because of different literary analyses of Romeo and Juliet, it doesn't now deny that Shakespeare didn't write it. Homer's Iliad, you know, if there's a different literary analyses on this. One of my favorite books in the Greek language is called Zedide Elbis, which means Hope Wanted by Andonis Samaragis, an amazing existential writer, post-war writer. And there are many, many, many different analyses on his work. Just because of various interpretations on, on his work, it doesn't now follow that he didn't write them. That's the first point. The second point I want to add is, you, you may have already known that in the Islamic tradition, we have something called a scope of interpretation. There's a scope of interpretation, which was something admitted by the companions themselves and by the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And interestingly, this scope of interpretation is scoped. And the reason it's scoped, because what we did as a community is to preserve the Arabic language and the meanings of those particular words. So I don't see how that question actually denies the basis or the truth of the Islamic tradition at all. So that would be my answer. No, that, that's not true. I give an example. You know, you have different views on liberal foreign policy. You have liberal interventionism. You have those who are not interventionists. And just because, you know, there's different, it's, it's a human reality because we're human agents. And that's just the, the reality of, 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 hu of humanity. And interestingly, when you look at the Islamic discourse, when you see the scholars differing, because you can choose a conflict here and there, but, the, but I don't think secularism has any more high ground. They've got far more conflict than anything else if you study history properly. Now, you see the scholars would always say, especially when it comes to matters called ishtihad, which is, you don't have anything conclusive, you're working hard within the source text of Islam to form a conclusion. 
All the ulama, the scholars would say, Wallahu alam, and God knows best. And for example, Imam Shafi, one of the amazing scholars of Islam, he would say, when I discuss with someone, I pray to Allah that the truth comes from his mouth. And when he made a conclusion to do with jurisprudence about Islam, he would basically say, I'm 99% true with an element of doubt. So we had a highly, highly nuanced tradition. So if we do read about it properly, I think you see that your question doesn't really apply in its totality. Thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll take the next question uh, from the SNSs. Uh, so we have a question for Ian, um, only because it's time to answer last. So Ian, what is your direct evidence that the Prophet Muhammad and his men gained power from Islam? Sorry, that his family gained power from... Yeah, so the question again, what is your direct evidence that the Prophet Muhammad and his family gained power from Islam? From Islam, okay. Simply the historical record. That differs slightly from the scientific record. Science is based mainly on observations and measurements, whereas the historical record consists of all the data we have handed down by earlier generations of humans. And the historical record can be tested and examined using scientific means. But the history of mankind has been well documented through archaeology and paleontology and um, geography and many, many different scientific ways, dating of many types. So we have a very accurate record of what happened in most parts of the world, especially where records were kept, such as the Middle East. So that's how we have uh, an accurate record of the life and times of the Prophet Muhammad. Well, I, I mentioned the classes of evidence. All you need to do is go to that evidence. You can go to a, a library or a museum and you can look up all the items of evidence there. There are many different items of different types, as I already mentioned, including documents and archaeological digs, everything. So, sorry, I can't hear you properly. Speak speak slightly that. slower if you can, I do apologize. Uh, yes. Okay, good. Well, I think claims by other religions is irrelevant. I've made a claim, analyze it and assess it. Just because another religion has made a similar claim, it doesn't now follow that my claim is not true. <laughs> it's a bit of a logical fallacy, right? So what I think you should do is take what I, 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 I spoke about into consideration. You could speak to me after, I give you a whole list of references and you could investigate that for yourself. What I gave you was the philosophical implications of the argument. If it's true that no one's been able to challenge the Quran, if it's true that when we exhaust the nature of the miraculous event, which is the Arabic language, and we can't produce the miraculous event, there's no naturalistic explanation. If that is true, then go and investigate it. If some other traditions have made similar claims, it doesn't now follow my claim is not true. That's the point. And secondly, I think you may be a little bit wrong. I don't think the, the Bible claims, or the Tao Te Ching claims, to be a linguistic miracle. It claims to have profound wisdom. My argument is not on the meaning of the Quranic discourse or the way it sounds to you. My argument is on the literary structures which is more observable and objective. Those are two different things and I hope that, could clar that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, we take the next question uh, from that side of the room. So we're going to sort of back and forth. Uh, here we have a question in the far corner. This one is to Ian. Yeah, great. Sir, would you believe if I tell you that there was a big ship which was loaded with equipment and it went from China to Singapore and then to America and then to Antarctica without any captain or control center? Sir, I think there's only a follow-up question. Can we just 
Ask a follow-up question now, right away. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just yes or no. Okay, would I believe it? Well, I'm not quite sure I get the drift, but I think you're, ask, you're explaining to me perhaps something that I wouldn't explain, asking me what evidence I would seek to believe it. Well, I would, the first thing I'd do is show me the evidence for this ship existing, if it sounded very unlikely. If, it, if the evidence stacked up, I certainly would believe it, yes, of course. I, I follow the evidence. Do scientists believe things? Scientists don't generally say whether they believe this or that. They say that I have confidence in this or that because the evidence supports it or doesn't support it. So I often say, show me the evidence if I'm confronted with something I don't understand. How do I, how do I believe that the universe created itself? Was that the, the question? Ah, yes. Thank you. I understand the question. The ship runs by itself. I might accept that. And would the universe run by itself? Well, I mentioned, I showed you a slide before describing the four forces. If we had more time, I could go into each of those forces. I've studied cosmology and physics a fair bit. And what it shows is that the universe, at least, at least within one microsecond after the Big Bang, ever since the universe has indeed been running itself, there's no evidence of any intervention. This doesn't this doesn't mean that um, it has a remote pilot or anything like that. It's a natural protest, a process. Scientists call it a naturalistic explanation of the world, where natural things like the four forces uh, run the universe. And there's certainly no evidence of any god or supernatural being or prophets or holy books that can change that situation. So yes, indeed, I believe that the universe is running itself and has been for 13 billion years. Okay, thank you for the we're now going to take an SMS question uh, for Hansa. Uh, Hansa, you explain that infinite chains cannot exist. It would have to follow that God does not exist. Please explain. Yes, I already mentioned that in my presentation, the infinity, and I wasn't talking about infinity chains, by the way. The chains I was talking about is infinite regus of causes, and that's a different story. And I was talking about the actualized physical infinite, that this universe is in a state of infinity, is absurd. This doesn't now follow that God's infinity doesn't exist. Because I even mentioned there are two types of infinity we're talking about here, qualitative and quantitative. I don't want to talk about mathematics, I'm talking about the philosophical perspective on this issue. And the quantitative infinite is the infinite made up of discrete physical parts. God is uniquely one. God is eternal. His infinity is coherent from that perspective. So it wasn't about infinite chain. But even if you talk about infinite chains, then it doesn't negate God's existence. Why would it negate God's existence? God is not an infinite chain. So that's, that's, that's how I would basically describe it. What I think you should do is maybe re-clarify your question to understand what you really mean by the question. Because I did address it in my initial presentation. So you could reformulate the question. And as a result of doing so, we could answer it better, inshallah. So, hey, Bryce, I studied at this university and I specialized in physiotherapy. Uh, so, first of all, Wikipedia is not a source of uh, accreditation. So, sorry, guys, can we just get this back to the question? Just because we're running out of time, there's a question. Sorry. There are ev evolutionary concepts that science has attempted to prove and have failed. In regards to evolution, I want to know where, where the missing animals are leading from apes to humans. Thank you. Well, as regards missing links, there are many, many different fossils have been, also have been identified um, from many different sites around the world. The fossils linking apes and humans are very well established. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. The main problem is that every time a new fossil is discovered, it splits a gap into two. So if you talk about the gaps in the fossil record, all of a sudden, instead of one gap, you've got two. So the more fossils they find, the more that the evolution deniers uh, can deny it. And I'll just indicate to you that 
There's a little book here called The Evolution Deceit, which I picked up at the University of New South Wales. Now that is, is subtitled, The Scientific Collapse of Darwinism and Its Ideological Background, and it's based on the Islamic view. Because evolution isn't mentioned in the Quran, they say that it's wrong. Well, do you realise, especially to the Islamic students who might be studying at a university, to get hold of a book like this, which denies half of the fields of that university, and disparages all the scientists and researchers around the world who have studied evolution and found, found that evolution is the best explanation there is and fits all the facts. What an insult to them for an Islamic group to put out this book which denies half of what the university does. So, yes, evolution hangs together as a coherent theory and there is no other theory. The idea that God made it is no explanation at all and has been refuted so much. You can regard it to betting on a football Team. If your favourite team has played 10 matches and lost every one, you might be thinking about changing, the, changing sides. If, you've got, uh, if they've lost 100 times to one, you might think about very strongly about it. But the scientific evidence versus religion, the score is not 100 to one, it's a billion to zero. There is zero evidence for any creation or any God or any Islam. And there are a billion items of evidence in favour of science, which you can find out in any library. So if the score is a billion, a billion to zero, I suggest it's time to think about changing sides. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, we'll take a question from this side for Hamza. Hi, good day, Hamza. I, um, I'm one of your schools at Frederick and Soccer Street. My question is regarding... Thank you. Sir. You're welcome. My question is regarding your claim that the, uh, the Quran is, is miraculous. If it is miraculous, how can it um, be so misinterpreted by so many Muslims, such that it splits into, as we heard earlier, Sufism, Sunni, Shia, and which of the various branches of Islam, which are just all around the world, there's quite a few minority ones to be aware, and almost since the inception of Islam, they've been busily killing each other. So which is the true one, and which ones need to be wiped out as heretics and apostates, and which ones are correct? Yeah, it's a very silly one as well. Um, you should never ask a question by insulting someone in the beginning, that's not very nice. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, my point is this, I want you to think about your own question. I want to help you get the right intellectual tools to think about your question. Having different interpretations doesn't negate my argument. How does different interpretations of the meaning negate the fact that it's a literary structural miracle? It doesn't. You're talking about human agency, the meaning of the words, you're talking about political interpretations, and you're assuming as well that their interpretation is as a result of going to the text itself. It could be as a result of something external, because a lot of other interpretations that you're talking about were as a result of external philosophical influences. So the point is, there's a whole lot of assumptions in your question, and I would even say, it doesn't have, even have to be answered, because your question doesn't deny the fact that this book is, has numerical coherence, is a unique literary form. As I said, and I spoke to the other gentleman above, he was Greek apparently, that Shakespeare, we know it came from Shakespeare. There's different literary analyses on Shakespeare. Homer, different literary analyses on the works of Homer. John Fletcher, Antoni Samaragis, who wrote Zedida el Beast. There are different interpretations. It doesn't follow, and this is what logic teaches us, it doesn't logically follow that since you have a different interpretation or analysis on a literary text, it doesn't deny its authorship or even the fact that Shakespeare now didn't use the iambic pentameter. For example, the literary form of Shakespeare was the iambic pentameter, the blank verse, to trochaic verse. It's one form, but you can have many interpretations because of the meaning of the words that sit within that form. So your question is a red herring. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hamza. Uh, next question is again from the SMS. And this is to Ian. Um, if secularists morals shift across time in regards to changing social values, will acts such as incest be viewed as accepted in the future? Uh, so we'll probably have, just because of time, we'll probably have one last question after this, and then um, the debate will be over. Now the answer is no. Incest causes all sorts of problems and potential unhappiness, and is certainly not part of the um, secular outlook. That was short and sharp. Alright, thanks Ian.
Um, last question for Hamza. Right at the back over there. Last question. Uh, hello, everyone, and hello, Hamza again. Um, <laughs> a lot has been spoken about the Quran tonight, obviously, because it is the underpinning of the whole faith. Um, and unlike other religions, in my interpretation, uh, no other religions say that their holy text was written exclusively and by God and never adulterated, unlike the Quran, where it is claimed it is the unadulterated word of God passed down generation after generation per perfectly. Um, and so, uh, implicitly, if there are any contradictions within that text, because it is a pure word of God, then either God uh, was confused, which doesn't happen because God is omniscient, or God does not exist. Um, and I feel that there are some contradictions in the Quran that aren't just the result of... Sorry, sir, can we, can we just ask oh, the question? Okay. They're not diverging misinterpretations. I think that some uh, passages in the Quran directly contradict each other. For example, verse 2, 256 um, is one of the verses that says that there should be no compulsion in religion because truth will reveal itself. So pretty much, you know, they live in that die attitude. But then verse 929, it says, fight those who do not uh, believe in Allah on the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful. Uh, fight until they pay the tax and are obedient. How are those two consistent? extremely consistent because the Quranic interpretive methodology is that you interpret the Quran with the Quran first quote my name, misquote him without reading the few verses before and after, it is a, a typical strategy, let me give you the tools now to understand the Quran the Quran is interpreted with the Quran, for example the Quran mentions in one place those who are guided, they will go to paradise, or those who go to, these people go to paradise. It doesn't mention who. In other places, it specifies the people who go to paradise. So sometimes you have general verses, and those general verses are specified also in the Quran. So, concerning chapter 9, especially the verses that you're talking about, this was to do with a political situation with the polytheists that wanted to basically annihilate all the Muslims, convert them back to polytheism, or kill them all and God in his infinite mercy and because this is a I believe this is a verse of mercy because if God says to be passive then there'll be no community left so what God does and uses emotive language and in the context of all we have to defend yourself even if you maybe preemptive strikes because they wanted to annihilate everyone that from a legal language point of view you're not going to say in the context of all Tickle their toes and give them flowers. <laughs> You're obviously going to have this kind of language. So if you read the verses before, what does God say? God doesn't like transgressors. In other places in the Quran, sort of Baka referring to war, don't transgress. Talks about, you know, if, if they incline to peace, you incline to peace. So these verses are in a social political context. Do you see? So I think when we have the right tools to understand the Quran discourse, we won't make such questions because I think. We need to, I have these questions all the time on email. I, 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 give them, I don't even give them the answer, I give them the tool to say, read the 10 verses before, read the 10 verses after, or read the chapter itself, or read other verses in other chapters related to the same topic. And also read the prophetic traditions that explain these verses too. And if you have those tools, there's absolutely no incoherence at all in any shape or form. So that's probably the best answer to give, is to give the tools to understand the text from that perspective. Thank you. Are you, are you able to also inter Sorry, is that it? Sorry, I have to end it there. We've gone over time, and like we said, that was the last question. Um, feel free, if Hamza is uh, he's going to be hanging around, feel free to catch him after if you can. Um, we're, we're just going to end the debate there. Uh, I hope everyone bened benefited from this debate, hearing the two sides of the arguments uh, around the topic, the godless delusion. Uh, just Thank you all. Uh, we'd like to present Hamza and uh, Ian with small token of gifts.